Other children might be guided by the fear of anger or the desire of approbation, but neither the one nor the other had any effect upon these. Master Tom, not content with refusing to be ruled, must needs set up as a ruler, and manifested a determination to keep, not only his sisters, but his governess in order, by violent manual and pedal applications, and as he was a tall, strong boy of his years, this occasioned no trifling inconvenience. A few sound boxes on the ear on such occasions might have settled the matter easily enough, but as, in that case, he might make up some story to his mother, which she would be sure to believe, as she had such unshaken faith in his veracity, though I had already discovered it to be by no means unimpeachable, I determined to refrain from striking him, even in self-defense, and in his most violent moods my only resource was to throw him on his back and hold his hands and feet till the frenzy was somewhat abated. To the difficulty of preventing him from doing what he ought not was added that of forcing him to do what he ought. Often he would positively refuse to learn, or to repeat his lessons, or even to look at his book. Here again a good birch-rod might have been serviceable, but as my powers were so limited, I must make the best use of what I had. As there were no settled hours for study and play, I resolved to give my pupils a certain task, which, with moderate attention, they could perform in a short time. Until this was done, however weary I was, and however perverse they might be, nothing short of parental interference should induce me to suffer them to leave the schoolroom, even if I should sit with my chair against the door to keep them in. Patience, firmness, and perseverance were my only weapons, and these I resolved to use to the utmost. I determined always strictly to fulfill the threats and promises I made, and to that end I must be cautious to threaten and promise nothing that I could not perform. Then I would carefully refrain from all useless irritability and indulgence of my own ill temper. When they behaved tolerably, I would be as kind and obliging as it was in my power to be in order to make the widest possible distinction between good and bad conduct. I would reason with them, too, in the simplest and most effective manner. When I reproved them, or refused to gratify their wishes, after a glaring fault, it should be more in sorrow than in anger. Their little hymns and prayers I would make plain and clear to their understanding. When they said their prayers at night and asked pardon for their offenses, I would remind them of the sins of the past day, solemnly, but in perfect kindness, to avoid raising a spirit of opposition, penitential hymns should be said by the naughty, cheerful ones by the comparatively good, and every kind of instruction I would convey to them, as much as possible, by entertaining discourse, apparently with no other object than their present amusement in view. By these means I hoped in time both to benefit the children and to gain the approbation of their parents and also to convince my friends at home that I was not so wanting in skill and prudence as they supposed. I knew the difficulties I had to contend with were great, but I knew, at least I believed, unremitting patience and perseverance could overcome them, and night and morning I implored divine assistance to this end. But either the children were so incorrigible, the parents so unreasonable, or myself so mistaken in my views, or so unable to carry them out, that my best intentions and most strenuous efforts seemed productive of no better results than sport to the children, dissatisfaction to their parents, and torment to myself. The task of instruction was as arduous for the body as for the mind. I had to run after my pupils to catch them, to carry or drag them to the table, and often forcibly to hold them there till the lesson was done. Tom I frequently put into a corner, seating myself before him in a chair with a book which contained the little task which must be said or read, before he was released in my hand. He was not strong enough to push both me and the chair away, so he would stand twisting his body and face into the most grotesque and singular contortions, laughable, no doubt, to an unconcerned spectator, but not to me, and uttering loud yells and doleful outcries, intended to represent weeping, but wholly without the accompaniment of tears. I knew this was done solely for the purpose of annoying me, and therefore, however I might inwardly tremble with impatience and irritation, I manfully strove to suppress all visible signs of molestation, and affected to sit with calm indifference, waiting till it should please him to cease this pastime, and prepare for a run in the garden, by casting his eye on the book, and reading or repeating the few words he was required to say. Sometimes he was determined to do his writing badly, and I had to hold his hand to prevent him from purposely blotting or disfiguring the paper. Frequently I threatened that, 
If he did not do better, he should have another line. Then he would stubbornly refuse to write this line, and I, to save my word, had finally to resort to the expedient of holding his fingers upon the pen and forcibly drawing his hand up and down, till, in spite of his resistance, the line was in some sort completed. Yet Tom was by no means the most unmanageable of my pupils. Sometimes, to my great joy, he would have the sense to see that his wisest policy was to finish his tasks and go out and amuse himself till I and his sisters came to join him, which frequently was not at all, for Mary Ann seldom followed his example in this particular. She apparently preferred rolling on the floor to any other amusement. Down she would drop like a leaden weight, and when I, with great difficulty, had succeeded in rooting her thence, I had still to hold her up with one arm, but with the other I held the book from which she was to read or spell her lesson. As the dead weight of the big girl of six became too heavy for one arm to bear, I transferred it to the other, or if both were weary of the burden, I carried her into a corner, and told her she might come out when she should find the use of her feet and stand up. But she generally preferred lying there like a log till dinner or tea-time, when, as I could not deprive her for meals, she must be liberated, and would come crawling out with a grin of triumph on her round red face. Often she would stubbornly refuse to pronounce some particular word in her lesson, and now I regret the lost labor I have had in striving to conquer her obstinacy. If I had passed it over as a matter of no consequence, it would have been better for both parties than vainly striving to overcome it as I did, but I thought it my absolute duty to crush this vicious tendency in the bud, and so it was, if I could have done it, and had my powers been less limited, I might have enforced obedience. But as it was, it was a trial of strength between her and me, in which she generally came off victorious, and every victory served to encourage and strengthen her for a future contest. In vain I argued, coaxed, entreated, threatened, and scolded. In vain I kept her from play, or if obliged to take her out, refused to play with her, or to speak kindly, or have anything to do with her. In vain I tried to set before her the advantages of doing as she was bid, and being loved and kindly treated in consequence, and the disadvantages of persisting in her absurd perversity. Sometimes, when she would ask me to do something for her, I would answer, Yes, I will, Mary Ann, if you will only say that word. Come, you'd better say it at once, and have no more trouble about it. No! Then, of course, I can do nothing for you. With me, at her age or under, neglect and disgrace were the most dreadful of punishments, but on her they made no impression. Sometimes, exasperated to the utmost pitch, I would shake her violently by the shoulder, or pull her long hair, or put her in the corner, for which she punished me with loud, shrill, piercing screams that went through my head like a knife. She knew I hated this, and when she had shrieked her utmost, would look into my face with an air of vindictive satisfaction, exclaiming, Now then, that's for you! and then shriek again and again till I was forced to stop my ears. Often these dreadful cries would bring Mrs. Bloomfield up to inquire what was the matter. Mary Ann is a naughty girl, ma'am. But what are these shocking screams? She is screaming in a passion. I never heard such dreadful noise. You might be killing her. Why is she not out with her brother? I cannot get her to finish her lessons. But Mary Ann must be a good girl and finish her lessons. This was blandly spoken to the girl, and I hope I shall never hear such terrible cries again. And fixing her cold, stony eyes upon me, with a look that could not be mistaken, she shut the door and walked away.